and repeat. Uh, my name is Ron Schneider. I'm CTO co-founder of Diagrid and a Dapper maintainer and stream committee member. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Arthur. I'm engineering manager for the Dapper team at Microsoft. Also a maintainer and uh, SVP member. And today we're going to talk to you about a few updates uh, that we've been seeing for the Dapper project that we'd like to share with the broader community and everyone, and also talk about pluggable components in Dapper, which were recently introduced in uh, Dapper 1.9. And before we uh, go into all the details, I really want to thank our amazing community contributors who really helped drive pluggable components into Dapper. This is something we've been talking about, I think, since the very first versions of Dapper, right, Arthur? Um, how we want to basically extend Dapper and, and make it pluggable so that people can bring in their own components. So thank you to uh, all of our amazing contributors. And so let's talk a little bit about what Dapper is and what Dapper does. Um, as a, an application developer writing a distributed system or a microservice architecture on top of Kubernetes or anywhere really, uh, you might be writing something like this, right? You might have a bunch of services that communicate with each other. They might have a, a queue or a database they're writing to. You might have a secret store, a configuration store, you know, the underlying infrastructure for all of your applications. Um, and it looks simple on the surface, but um, when you get into the nitty gritty details of it, uh, there are many, many distributed systems challenges that developers have to solve each and every day, really, with every new feature also. So things like, how do you do state management for multiple replicas writing to the same record? Uh, how do you do conflict management at scale? How do you do error handling and fault resiliency when you talk to your message bus? How do you delay messages being sent over an event-driven system? Uh, how do you secure messages not just between your service-to-service -service calls, but to your database and encrypt those connections and rotate their, these keys? So lots of these distributed systems challenges uh, are meeting developers. Um, and as complexity rises, these uh, challenges rise too. And so uh, Dapper comes in as the set of APIs, distributed systems APIs, uh, that allow developers to focus on their code, on their business logic, and really remove the boilerplate code associated uh, with all of these hard problems. So Dapper can be invoked by HTTP or gRPC, so it's very inclusive to, the, to developers everywhere. Uh, if you're using a uh, language that knows how to talk to HTTP or gRPC, you can use Dapper. And we have a bunch of these APIs. We're not going to cover uh, all of them today, but some of the things you can see here are service-to-service -service invocation, which is a way to find, uh, discover, and secure communication calls, state management, which allows you to save state and get state in a reliable way, uh, PubSub, which allows you to very easily create a event-driven system without all the boilerplate code and issues associated with it, resource bindings, which is a way to trigger your application based on events coming in from external systems, um, actors, uh, this is a very specific programming model that distributes compute and state uh, at a high granular rate. Uh, observability and secrets are ways to uh, basically observe everything that's going on in Dapper because Dapper is at the intersection of all of your application communications. Dapper basically observes everything for you, um, whether it traverses service to service calls or whether it's coming in from something like Kafka, AWS, SQS, without you as a developer needing to take any SDKs and dependencies into your code. And these APIs are being added by the community at a very active pace. And of course, Dapper is not only tied to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, of course, the best way to run Dapper today. But Dapper runs as a single binary on your laptop, whether you're using a Mac, a Linux, or a Windows machine. Um, so really, Dapper does the heavy lifting for you. And this is how you use Dapper. You have your application process, the Dapper process. It calls over HTTP or gRPC. And these are uh, a bunch of examples of how, for example, you would use Dapper to discover a different application wherever it's running just by its name um, and invoke a method or uh, get some state or publish a message to the uh, orders topic or get a secret from some secret store called Apple. So as a developer, you get these consistent APIs um, and Dapper basically makes sure that everything's secure, reliable, and, and traceable uh, under the hood. So at this point, you might think, well, does Dapper replace state stores or PubSub? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. It integrates with over 105 components that represents uh, the majority of services that you will find in uh, clouds like AWS, Google Cloud, and Azure, and also open source ones. Um, so these are just a few here on the right. But Dapper has um, a very uh, extensible model to it, where you can come in uh, to our repository. You can add in a, a different component. And when we launched Dapper uh, in 1.0, how many components did we have? Like seven or eight, um, I think. And uh, since then, we maintainers did not contribute a single component. Um, all of these components were contributed by our amazing community. So Dapper really integrates. So 
So as a developer, you let your developers talk to a very consistent and portable API, but as an operator infrastructure person, you can decide what the underlying implementation is based on the environment that you're running in, and it's basically a, a YAML swap. Um, but Dapper is not only just a lowest common denominator play. In many cases, Dapper will add features on top of these implementations that you won't find on their open source version or even their cloud versions. Uh, this is a, uh, an update for the community traction that we're seeing. Dapper today is the ninth largest project in CNCF based on the report that was released by CNCF uh, a month ago, I think it was. Uh, we're seeing lots of amazing uh, companies contributing to the project. Um, yeah, we have over uh, 2,200 computers, contributors today, and our Discord community is growing. Uh, please join us after the talk. Uh, it'd be great to get your thoughts and feedback on the project. And so this is really how Dapper components are plugged into our runtime today. So we have the Dapper binary. Dapper is written in Go, which means that every time you want to add a binary, oh, sorry, a component to the Dapper binary, you need to go to our repository, you need to basically write the implementation in Go, it has to be Go because Dapper is written in Go. We will accept the PR, we'll approve it, we'll LGTM it, um, and then when the next version of Dapper ships, it'll get compiled into the Dapper binary. And that's where we have over 100 different components. Um, but many organizations actually need to extend Dapper for Dapper to be able to talk to systems that are proprietary to their own organizations or uh, if they have some kind of business logic that's an IP to their company and they can't actually contribute it upstream. So this is uh, a use case that we're seeing more and more of. And today it's very difficult adding these private components um, before version 1.9. So you'd have to fork the main Dapper repository. You would need to fork the components contrib repository, um, get those uh, local versions. You would need to write your custom component in Go which means if you're an organization that doesn't have knowledge in Go, you need to learn Go, it's I love Go, it's my favorite language. No, that's not true anymore. TypeScript no, is now my favorite language, but it's my second favorite one, especially for backend uh, stuff. And you know, you need to become an expert in it. All over the, it's, it's kind of easy, but you still need to learn Go, um, which is a major hurdle for many organizations. And then once you have your component set up, you basically need to integrate uh, it into Dapper, build your custom binary. If you're building a custom container, you need to go to the Dapper settings and basically pull off your version of the image. Um, so this is the, the configuration of the environment, really. So it's, it's kind of a convoluted process. But now in 1.9, we have the concept of pluggable components. So you, you can write a component in any language that supports gRPC. Um, and then you just need to package that into a container or a process, depending on whether or not you're running Dapper in a containerized environment or not, and then you just deploy uh, your application code. So this becomes really easy. Um, the core design tenants for us are, of course, to be uh, secure and performant. So we use Unix domain sockets. So uh, you can't invoke these components from outside of your local network namespace, whether you know it's your VM or, or a pod on Kubernetes. Uh, we're leveraging RPC standards, so there's no new RPC framework here. We're just leveraging good old gRPC. Um, which is fully supported, no limitations there on any gRPC features. Uh, there is very low operational overhead because we are leveraging existing Dapper CRD. So if you're familiar with the concept of a CRD, it's basically a Kubernetes resource that allows you to extend Kubernetes. And many projects that you will find basically deploy on top of Kubernetes have 10, 20, 30, some of them even have 80 CRDs. Um, and that adds a lot of operational overhead. In Dapper today, we have four CRDs. And so we did not add a new one to add pluggable components. We're basically reusing our same components already. And then it's platform agnostic. Uh, we make sure that everything we do in Dapper is uh, compliant both to Kubernetes and outside of Kubernetes. And so, uh, yes, pluggable components run inside of Kubernetes and outside of it. Something we ruled out uh, was to use Go plugins because it requires the use of Cgo. And uh, one of the uh, founders and creators of the Go uh, project, the Go runtime, um, basically said that Cgo is not Go. Um, if, you, if you Google Cgo is not Go, um, you will find the, uh, the, the article that explains why I'm not going to go into details here, but it's basically causing lots of cross-compilation issues. Uh, we'd basically be telling every Windows developer out there, no, you can't really you know, run pluggable components locally or on Windows machines, and there's low performance. Um, so it's, it takes a performance hit. And then there's also some dependency management in your host process in the plugin. If you have, uh, if you're referencing other packages, they must have the same version, and that creates version and conflict management, uh, and that becomes a real issue. And then, of course, you yeah, have the language support I talked about earlier. 
So this is the user experience, basically. Um, this is 80% of the user experience. So this is what a component CRD in Dapper would look like. It has the type there, which is state myDB. That's a custom pluggable component. Uh, I don't know if you know um, how Dapper CRDs look like. We probably should have put an image here, but it would basically change type state.mydb to something like state.aws.sqs if this was a component that's built into Dapper that you get with the uh, Dapper stable release. Uh, and so uh, just by putting state might be here, we're basically telling Dapper, hey, this is my own custom component, and you can have your own metadata, um, which uh, really targets whatever underlying system you might be writing this component for. And we use a, a domain socket. So you're, we at Dapper, basically, uh, the Dapper runtime looks at the local file system. It searches for a local domain socket. Um, and then it basically uh, looks for uh, other uh, processes that register, register to it, which would be the pluggable components. Um, and this is really what it looks like. So you have the Dapper D binary uh, uh, here on the left, and there is a discovery mechanism which will basically listen to sockets uh, on the file system. And this file system can be mounted on Kubernetes. Uh, it can be an in-memory file system too, by the way. Uh, and then you have the pluggable component process, which is a totally separate process to the Dapper D one. It can be a separate container inside of your deployment, or if you're running Dapper outside of Kubernetes, it can just be a process uh, co-located inside of your VM. And the important thing is that they both have access to the mounted file system uh, that you're giving it so that uh, Dapper can basically discover these pluggable components. Uh, once Dapper has discovered the socket uh, and the pluggable components have listened to the socket, they will basically connect um, and the pluggable components will connect to Dapper um, via gRPC. Uh, so Dapper will basically use gRPC reflection, the gRPC reflection API to talk to the component and discover all of its different properties and make sure that you know, it's, it's actually a Dapper pluggable component too and not just something that's not compliant to the uh, interface that Dapper expects. So this is basically how it works. And uh, adding private components now in, um, in standalone mode uh, is very simple. You basically uh, just give your uh, uh, pluggable component the, uh, the Unix domain socket path. You can see it here at Unix temp uh, Dapper component socket. Uh, and, and then uh, the component will basically just uh, uh, listen on the gRPC socket there. It's pretty simple. This is how it would look like in Kubernetes. Uh, no, sorry, not in Kubernetes. Uh, this is what the Dapper D uh, side will show once it discovered a pluggable component and successfully register it. So that's the line in red there. Uh, the line at the top bas is basically a Dapper CLI command. We have developer tooling. A Dapper will take basically your application, the Dapper sidecar, and run it together, and Dapper will successfully register the pluggable component um, if it was able to discover it via gRPC reflection, as I mentioned earlier. Um, adding components in Kubernetes looks like this. So the way to inject Dapper into your deployment YAML is basically to annotate it with a bunch of annotations, uh, which you can see on the bottom there. You go Dapper IO enable true, which means uh, Dapper, hey, I want you to inject the Dapper sidecar using a mutating uh, webhook, and then you, you have all other, uh, every other uh, annotation that you can think of, like an app ID to give your application an ID and app port. Um, and the very last one at the bottom is the Unix domain socket path. So inside of your application, you will mount a volume, which will be used to host the socket that both the pluggable component and Dapper listen on. So it's a, it's a very nice user experience. Um, inside of your uh, deployment YAML, that's something that's a little less nice, but we're working on improving that experience. Um, that's what you would need to do on your deployment side. Uh, you, of course, have your pluggable component. You built it into a Docker image. You pushed it into registry. And so you're adding it as an additional container inside of your deployment spec, inside of your pod spec. So you're uh, mounting the volume. Uh, it's all pretty easy stuff, standard here. Uh, nothing special that you need to do. It's all documented on our website, and uh, this, this makes up the user experience of how you would go about communicating and adding these uh, pluggable components. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Arthur. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, you can hear me? Awesome. Um, so for Proudest demo, we're gonna use Discord. So, and if you have Discord on your phone, you'll be able to interact with the demo. So um, if you don't have your one installed, you can take a time to install now. So, Let's get started with the demo. Uh, first of all, the code is uh, available uh, online. So you can go to GitHub with this URL here. Uh, might not be so readable, but basically Arthur Sousa could call NA. Can you zoom in a little, maybe? Uh, oh, I can zoom in right here. Yeah, not what, yeah. There you go. So you can go in, it's public, and you, and you can go through and try the demo yourself, okay? And we're gonna actually do this demo together here right now. So 
uh, to do this demo, you have to use basically you have make to uh, compile, uh, install the Docker CLI if you don't have one, uh, and you can also use, use to install the gRPC tool for local server invocation. Uh, and some other dependencies here depend on which part of the demo you're going to take. Um, so I have checked out the code already, and then uh, there's existing code for the mem store. So the same example that we saw um, on the slide, there's some echo going on here. Um, we will just simply do a .NET run, but before we do that, let's look at the code. So uh, let me zoom in one more time. There you go. So if I look at our pluggable components folder, you're going to see the mem store, which is basically a gRPC service in .NET. Uh, Program.cs basically handles the socket. So in this case, we're going to uh, put the socket in uh, slash DMP handle the socket creation. Um, and then we're going to configure the socket with adding the gRPC listening. And um, in this, we also need the gRPC reflection. Um, so whatever language you use to implement uh, a pluggable component for Dapper, uh, we require the gRPC reflection because that is one, that's the way we found to now require a new CRD and make Dapper sidecar automatically discover the components that are listed in the socket uh, in the socket directory. So every socket in the directory will be scanned by the sidecar, and are going to invoke uh, the reflection API for each one of them to dis auto discover what type of component that is. So that's how we could bring in uh, that simplicity. And uh, uh, kudos to uh, uh, Marcos uh, and Yadam for uh, having that idea and, and work on that change. Okay, so. Um, and then this is just handling the socket file. Um, one thing that I want to call out is, um, you can see this as an example, uh, but uh, as we work on that, we want to make that even easier. And we are now writing, on, we are writing new SDKs uh, for Dapper to compose components. So now you're not only going to have SDKs to use the Dapper APIs, but we're also writing uh, SDKs for which you make it very easy for you to write um, uh, any component in the languages, in the most popular languages that we have, which are .NET, uh, Java, uh, Python, and Go. Uh, these are the uh, SDKs that are going to come up. Um, and now I'm going to look at, show you how the service is implemented. So the mem store implements um, basically this interface. Sorry, Arthur, just, um, Go ahead. just one uh, comment there. Uh, although we are writing these SDKs to make it easier for you to write pluggable components, uh, it's important for me to call out that you can write them in any language even without the SDKs. You yeah. just need to do a little bit of gRPC plumbing, which is, isn't really uh, problematic for most people. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the call out. Um, so this is the interface that you're going to implement based on the gRPC service you're offering. Um, and you can do like the get to get a key set, to set a key, bulk set, to, have, to handle a bulk request. Init, so init method is the one that the sidecar will invoke, uh, passing the metadata that Yaron showed previously on the slide. So all those metadata attributes is per component. Some components, like the mem store, for example, that we implemented, doesn't require any metadata attribute, but you could pass like a URL, um, you could even pass a secret if you want, uh, and you use a secret reference uh, a feature that Dapper has. If you're not familiar with that, I recommend taking a look later. Um, and of course, ping for the health check of your component. So uh, with that, um, we can go to the folder, pluggable components, uh, mem store, and then we do the .NET run. There we go. Um, one thing um, I'm going to show is um, I'm going to show that in the in the Dapper CLI, it stores a folder for you with components, and we change the mem store uh, YAML file to handle the mem store. So, like you can see, it's as simple as that. It doesn't require any metadata, and you, in this case, you're not going to be using Redis. We're going to use be using uh, the mem store. Okay. Now, if I go back to our demo list, we can go now to the Hello World on Quick Starts. And we're going to run the same uh, Quick Start uh, that I don't know if people have tried Dapper already, but this is a usual Quick Start for Hello World 
uh, to make uh, invocations. So they're going to go to a different folder. There you go. And I'm just going to do uh, npm install. Uh, actually, I've done this before, but it should be fast. And then we're going to be able to run the Node.js application. So the Node.js application, if you haven't seen this example before, um, all it does is receives a call from the um, Python application that we're going to run in a minute and saves that state to a state store. As simple as that. So I'm running this in a new terminal. And can we see the mem store detected? Uh, OK. I'm not going to spend uh, too much time trying to look for the message now, but let's just proceed to the next step of the demo, where we're going to run now, uh, we can invoke actually this service MC. Um, Okay. So what, what Arthur is showing right now are two applications, a Python app invoking a Node.js app through Dapper. So it's invoking with Dapper directly, and so you get MTLS observability, telemetry, all of the Dapper features, and that yeah. Node app is going to get that request from the Python app through Dapper and going to save it to the state store, which is the custom pluggable component state store, which isn't compiled in the Dapper binary. Yeah, so in this example, uh, I did not end up running the Python app, by the way, but okay. <laughs> I did use the Dapper invoke feature uh, to make the invocation, and you can see here, that uh, the state was saved. Got new order. There you go. And the save was persisted. So now let's look at a more cool demo. Uh, this is just for you to get started on local development. Um, so this is this is show the other demo now. So if you have um, uh, seen the Twitter processing demo in the past, uh, there are multiple demos online. You can see that um, it basically um, uses Dapper with the Twitter input binding to receive tweets. You make a service invocation to the sentiment processor to do sentiment analysis. Uh, annotate the payload with that extra information. Saves to a state store. Publishes to a pub subtopic. And there's another application with a dashboard that consumes uh, those uh, tweets with the sentiment analysis results and displays on the dashboard, OK? And um, so we're going to do this. The demo is already running. Uh, but I'm going to go through some of the steps um, with you guys. So um, this is also a time if you want to uh, uh, interact to download, to connect to our Discord server for the demo. So if you have Discord, I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, so what we did is we took the Twitter binding and we wrote a custom component in Java that will instead take messages from Discord. So uh, and you, I don't know if you follow TechCrunch, but today was announced that Twitter has a new owner. So how convenient my demo to replace Twitter by, by through Discord. So uh, just uh, some news there. So the Twitter going to be basically Discord. Um, so I'm going to show the QR code one more time. Anybody else need to scan this? OK. So uh, I have this demo running uh, for a few days now, as you can see. Um, and I'm going to do uh, pods without getting all namespaces so you can have a clear view of what's going on. So what you will see is that um, the processor is the one that does the sentiment analysis and still only has uh, two sidecars. But if you look at the provider, it now has three sidecars. Three containers. Sorry, three containers. Uh, two of them are different sidecars. Uh, one sidecar for Dapper and one for uh, the pluggable component. So if I do logs on this particular pod, you're going to show, gonna show that you have provider, which is the name of the application, Discord, and Dapper D. And then you can put Discord here. And you're going to see that we already got some messages, but uh, thanks for that. <laughs> 
so the demo is already working, as we can all see. Uh, and the upper D, are you going to see anything interesting here? Uh, yeah, it shows that we detected one binding component. Uh, okay, awesome. So we are all up and running, uh, but also going to do a describe. So we're going to describe the deployment. And uh, one thing you will see is that you have the same annotations that Yada mentioned. Um, in this case, we'll use a custom image, but that's uh, just uh, a detail for this demo. I don't really require that. Um, and you have the Unix domain socket path the same way that the application requires. Um, OK, now that we have done that, uh, Let's go to the demo before I show you more of the code, OK? So let's do a port forward. And then we're going to do port 8080. OK. I didn't make any typo. It should work. There you go. Now I'm going to open my browser. I keep forgetting where my browser is. That's my usual problem here. There you go. I'll go host. There you go. So now if people want to try out and send some messages, we can see them here. So please be nice. Don't send angry messages. There you go. So you still see the Twitter logo because that's how the demo was originally built for. But it's all coming from Discord now. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we're not done yet. <laughs> There's more. Yeah, I didn't thank you. I thank the people sending in the Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, yeah, and then now we're going to see um, some of the code that we did to get this done. Okay, so you saw in .NET uh, MemStore, and this one's a little bit more complicated. Uh, it uses the input binding, um, so we have to stream the messages um, from the from the Discord API into um, the sidecar. So let's open this code a little bit. Um, so the server um, does the same thing as the .NET um, equivalent, where it basically manages the socket for you. Like, how do you um, start this on the socket, how you change the permission to make sure another process can read and write to it. So, uh, so this code is what we think it should belong in a, in a SDK that makes make things easier for you, because there's nothing specific uh, for us to handle here. Uh, but then the core of the code is actually in the Discord uh, binding implementation, where um, you basically have uh, the init that we discussed. And in this example, we do get a token. So I'm going to show the YAML in a minute. So we do actually get the token to connect to Discord through the metadata. Um, and it's not hard coded and, at all, but you still get it here uh, for in, your, in your code. So and then we start the client, and then we uh, respond to the message. We also had the ping, and we also had uh, the read. So the read, we basically start, uh, in this case, is using the Discord SDK behind the scenes. I don't even know if there's a Discord SDK for Go. Maybe there is, but. Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, and then we're going to keep forwarding the messages, uh, do a lot to make sure it's working, and then we're going to create a payload following the same structure as the Twitter binding was working before to make sure we keep the compatibility so it's a pluggable, so we can remove one and put all the other one in place with no code change in the rest of the code. Um, and then those messages uh, are going to be sent um, in the response observer. So this is how uh, we wrote uh, a binding component um, in Java. And I'm going to show you in a, in a moment right now how does the component actually look like. Um, let me just move here. So the all the Kubernetes artifacts you need for this demo are available in the repository as well. So uh, I'm going to open up uh, the Discord example. And by the even the MemStore example, you can run a Kubernetes as well if you want uh, a simpler, uh, um, uh, easier way to, to get this working. So as you can see, we have the metadata. It has the token. And this is a nice feature that Dapper has. and um, for those that are not familiar with that, Dapper has a secret store, and our components are integrated natively with that. Um, and also, in this case, I'm using the Kubernetes secret itself. And you can see how I referenced that without having to hard code the token on my demo. 
So you can, uh, there's the examples of how to get the Discord token if you want to do this yourself. But that's how we manage secrets um, in Dapper. Um, uh, the configuration, I added a new, is a new feature here, but that's a different, a different conversation. Um, uh, the processor, uh, this is uh, the same way we use for the original Twitter demo. And in this case, I'm using Azure, using Azure Economy Services. Uh, and you can use that yourself. Or if you want, you can change um, the code to not use Azure and just do a random sentiment analysis um, in the code. Um, the provider is the one that we actually use uh, the pluggable component. And like, uh, like we saw on Kubernetes, it has the custom image, but it has also the domain socket path. And it has the container for the provider and the container for Discord. And um, you can use this image as, as well uh, from Docker Hub. Uh, this is the image I built with this same code. Uh, and then PubSub has no difference. Is the usual pub sub again using the key secret reference? Uh, in this case, <coughs> uh, there's nothing different in particular for this demo for that. Uh, the the state store also Redis, um, and the view application uh, um, also just the same as we had before. There was no change there. So um, yeah, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, yes, thank you. And we are here for questions. Yes. You can get a Dapper mug as well if you make a question. Oh, that's a good idea. You're going to get a Dapper mug now for asking questions? So. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, thank you. That was an excellent talk. Thank um, you. I appreciated the description of how Dapper provides APIs. Um, I was wondering, for those who aren't familiar, could you go over the merits of the PubSub architecture? Um, and then as well, uh, could you uh, briefly describe the gRPC reflection API? I'm unfamiliar. Uh, describe the what, sorry? The uh, gRPC reflection API. Yeah, so uh, I'll start off with the PubSub question. So your question was, uh, what are the merits of the PubSub API? Yeah. So. Uh, Many times you would want to create an event-driven architecture where you publish a message and these uh, publishers are de decoupled from subscribers. And it's very hard to create it on your own because if you have multiple subscribers or even multiple publishers, you need to basically handle scale. Um, you know, how do you handle error handling or throttling from the publisher if you're a subscriber? You need to start learning about consumer groups and partitions and how you listen on these and handle you know, errors and, and uh, faults coming in from these concepts. And so Dapper really encapsulates all of that for you. It creates consumer groups, creates partitions, it configures them. The only thing you need to do as a publisher is just reach to the, to the Dapper API and say, hey, Dapper, publish this message. And as a subscriber, you have an HTTP endpoint that you put in your app. Dapper will send you the message uh, on your application code. Um, or if you're using gRPC, it'll, it'll send it back. Um, the gRPC reflection API is something that we only use for pluggable components, and that's basically a way for gRPC services to discover uh, properties or characteristics of, of other uh, gRPC services. Um, and so Dapper will basically use this reflection API to reflect on the properties of the pluggable component and see that it uh, answers all of its requirements. All right, more questions? This one over there. Uh, hi. I want to know how long a particular message can stay in the queue before it is consumed by uh, another component. Th that, that depends on the component. Um, so that's a configuration that you can have in your Redis or uh, Azure Service Bus. Uh, but Dapper can also add a feature on top, which is a message TTL, that optionally you can put a metadata parameter that says, oh, this message is in the queue only for, let's say, one day. Uh, and then the Dapper sidecar that consumes that, we understand that and don't send that to the application. And we can also bundle that feature with that letter Q and have that message be sent to that letter Q via Dapper, which is basically another pub sub component. So uh, you can have that done all within the Dapper uh, uh, layer itself. Or if you want, you can also do the same within the broker that you chose if it is a native feature. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, there is one more follow-up question. So I'm uh, thinking about this in the context of workflows. So is there a way to cancel a job which is running for too long, for example, a dapper uh, endpoint, which uh, is processing for a very long time? Not right now, but we are going to add uh, workflows as code to dapper. It's a community proposal that's being discussed right now. 
And so you will get these, uh, these types of, of APIs and, and operations in Dapper. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions? Come get your mug after. Oh yeah, you asked a question, get a mug. Yeah. Yeah. There's one more Actually, question. everyone will get mugs if you come fast enough after we're done, we have this. So I have, I have um, four mugs total, so the first four questions only. All right. <laughs> I have what I think is a basic question, but I, I might have missed it. To consume the Dapper API, in your application, do you have client libraries that you import, include that package? Okay, and then locally you're just doing REST or gRPC to the sidecar? Yes, and, and actually actually the SDK, um, most of them I think you use gRPC. Awesome. Which is faster. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, Great. thank you everyone. Thanks again.